Good to see you here this morning. Good to have Orlando with us um, as we look at the sovereignty of God. And hopefully it'll answer the question whether um, God had already determined that you would be here or you, whether you came by your own free choice or whether it's somewhere in between those two things or whether they're connected. Hopefully you'll get the answers to that and uh, a few other things as well. So we're really glad that Orlando's here. He's done a good book on this subject as well that's really accessible. And I can say that from having actually read it. So uh, do check that out. He might make, you're, you're free to make a plug for that. Is it called The Big God? Something like that. Yeah, something like that. Okay, yeah. But that is well worth reading. And what, worth um, encouraging others to read because there are more difficult books to read on this subject and some that are more accessible. And depending who you've got in your churches, um, Orlando's book would be a really good starter on that. So I'm going to speak to the Lord now to ask him to help us. Um, and uh, then I'll hand over to Orlando. Let's uh, pray. Our God and our Father, we thank you that since we've come to know you by your great kindness in opening our eyes to see your son and what he was doing for us in his life and death and resurrection since then you've opened up our eyes to the whole aspect of who you are and what it means for you to rule over this whole universe and to bring everything into being and lord that stretches our minds and also causes all sorts of questions to arise and we ask lord as we meet this morning that you would help orlando to uh, make things clear that your spirit, Lord, would be at work in us to help us understand your ways better as far as we can. Mm. And we would ask, Lord, that we would not try and tie everything up neat and tidily for our own convenience, but would allow room in our hearts and our minds and our thinking for the hugeness of who you are and the extent of your rule over all things. So, Lord, please help Orlando and help us too as we chat afterwards that all of this will um, be a good stimulus to us in our maturing and in our growth and our appreciation of who you are. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Orlando. Well, thank you very much indeed. Lovely to be here. Lovely to see everybody. Um, should we open the Bible uh, as we begin? I've put the passage on the screen, so if you really object to flipping through the Word of God, you can just glance up in a kind of lazy sort of way. Uh, but uh, here it is, Romans 11, verse 33. And here it is. Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has been his counsellor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. They're wonderful words, aren't they? That little doxology. I hope simply hearing them read there as we begin our time together this morning will have begun to cast our eyes heavenward to some degree. You're all old hands here. I know you're familiar with the shape of the letter to the Romans. You know these verses where they come at the end of this big, long reflection on the faithfulness of God to his people and to his promises in 9, 10, 11. But actually, I think they look further back than that. I think in these verses, Paul is pausing to, as it were, just take a, a breath, uh, take a step back uh, and um, respond, I guess, to everything he's written so far in the letter. He's spoken of all those subjects, you know, the sinfulness of humanity, the, the righteousness of God, justification by faith, the new humanity, in the second Adam, the freedom of the believer, the work of the Spirit, much else besides. And now, as I say, he's, he's pausing and stepping back, taking that breath and turning his face heavenward. And he's celebrating all that God has accomplished in the way he's accomplished it. Oh, the depth of the riches of 
of the wisdom and knowledge of God. I don't want to spend too long here. I know I'm teaching grandmothers to suck eggs, but as Paul shines his spotlight on the character of God here, it might be worth us just trying to follow the direction of that beam and at least log in our minds the two main areas he seems to be illuminating for us. One of them is there, the, the divine mind, so the wisdom and knowledge of God, his judgments, his paths. Uh, verse 34, the mind of the Lord. Uh, the knowledge and the wisdom of God, they're, they're, they're beyond our ability to fathom, aren't they? We just don't get it. We talk about God's omniscience, his all-knowing, and his omnisapience, his all-wise. Uh, you might be a somewhat sapient homo, he is an omni-sapient deus. He knows the future as completely as he knows the past. He knows me as an individual as well as I know myself and obviously better. His mind functions at a different frequency to yours or mine. So there's one patch of the character of God that Paul shines his light on. There's a second it's on his activity. So verse 33, who's ever given to God that God should repay them? That is, God is not a receiver. He, he's, not a, he's not a banker with whom you can put in some funds and build up a credit balance that you have the right to withdraw at your leisure. He's not someone you can manipulate or put in your debt. He is fundamentally not a responder at all. He's an initiator. Um, I have to say, I, I'm sure that the NIV gets verse 33 wrong. Uh, it is not just the riches of God's wisdom and knowledge. It is God's riches in themselves and his wisdom and knowledge. Um, everything there is his. Uh, given the context of verse 35 and 36, I'm sure that's what Paul is saying. Verse 36, for from him and through him and for him, are all things. That is to say, he is the source of everything. He is the agent of everything. He's the goal of everything. If we want to understand what's going on in the world, or in the churches we're seeking to serve, or in our families, or just in our own lives, we don't need to go online and buy another book from ten of those, or a good book, or whatever it is. Or go to the mirror, look there, we look at God. It all starts and ends with him. So you see what he's driving at. God's knowledge is complete. He is the one who, Isaiah 46 verse 10, declares the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. Got it all up there, as it were. And God's activity is everywhere. He is the one, Ephesians 1, 11, isn't it? He works at everything, everything, in accordance with the purpose of his will. And the fact that his knowledge is complete and his activity is everywhere is, says Paul, something to be celebrated. To him be the glory forever and ever. Uh, that is the backdrop of everything I want to say this morning. We've kind of done the hard work now, the rest is just details. Uh, but it may be nice, actually, just why don't we just spend a couple of minutes just where we're sitting, twos and threes, just to... Uh, respond to those truths as we begin our time this morning. Maybe just riff off that doxology yourself, turn Paul's words into prayers of praise and adoration um, to this glorious God of ours. Should we do that? 90 seconds? Quick, quick fire, just in twos and threes where you are. Okay, well if I could uh, draw us back. I, um, I describe those glorious themes in that doxology as the backdrop to everything I want to say this morning. That's because I take it they're really the backdrop to everything in terms of the way we live our whole lives. Isn't that right? His knowledge is complete and his activity is everywhere. The problem is that for many people in our churches, 
I imagine that's, that's all they are, those truths. The backdrop. They're out there somewhere. An enormous gap between those convictions about God, which I imagine most of us don't need much convincing about, the, the gap between those theoretical convictions out there and the immediate realities of how we and those we're trying to minister to actually live and think in the moment and each day. You'll be familiar with the concept of an exclusion zone, I'm sure, if you're older than me, which is one or two in this room. Uh, you will remember the Falkland Islands conflict back in the 80s, that 200-mile exclusion zone declared by the UK government around the Falklands. Is it coming back? Do you remember that? Some nods around the room. The idea was that Argentine ships and planes could have free range the world over in general, but the specific area around the Falklands was sacrosanct. Only room for British forces there, and woe betide any foreign craft who strayed into that exclusion zone. Uh, I don't know how it is in your ministry, but where I am, I regularly come across a tendency in even the most mature Christian believers, actually, for people to set up, as it were, an exclusion zone for God's knowledge and his activity. Do you know what I'm talking about? Areas that feel particularly close to home and where they therefore don't really consider divine knowledge and activity to be free to operate. They never put it that way, obviously, but, but effectively that's what they seem to be doing. They're constructing God-free zones. I, I say they. Uh, actually, I doubt any of us are completely immune to this. I imagine we all uh, have that tendency sometimes. I certainly see it in myself to redraw the map of life with God-free zones marked on them. Now, what are those zones? One of the most obvious, I suppose, is the area of personal decision-making. Um, Connor was alluding to that earlier on in the introduction. To what extent is my will free from God's interference? Um, we're going to look at that after coffee. Um, but for this first session, I, I want us to think about pain and hardship. To what extent is God connected with the suffering in my life or the lives of those I love. Can there be any link? Given that God is all good and all loving, surely I need to draw an exclusion zone, 200 miles preferably, around the pain in my life. God can't have any part in this, surely. Again, a massive question in terms of our day-to-day -day ministry. We're often, I take it, called on to minister to those who are struggling to steer their way through these kind of issues. Um, and I, to be honest, I wouldn't mind betting that some of us uh, struggle to get our own heads around it. Um, I guess there'll be a number here who've been knocked for six by something in recent times and maybe who are right in the middle of that, even now. Um, I wonder if I can ask you, do you have um, prosperity teaching churches near where you are operating? Soft. soft. Yeah, there's lots of softness, isn't it? We, we have a few in Southampton. Um, they're never going to be all that far away, especially with the internet as it is, and I often discover people who are looking to internet sort of nutrition being rather surprised at the sources they seem to be um, uh, favouring. If you've come across prosperity teaching somewhere along the line, you'll likely be aware of three claims that are frequently made in those circles about suffering. One, uh, suffering for the Christian is not normal. Uh, there is something going wrong if a Christian believer experiences pain. He or she must be deficient in their faith in some way because it's not part of the standard, healthy Christian life. It's just not normal. Two, suffering for the Christian is not 
of God. The Father would never inflict hardship on one of his dear children. He wants us to prosper, not to suffer. If you or any other believer suffers, you might put it down to any number of things, but it's not divine in origin. It's not of God. And three, which really follows on from two, suffering is therefore not purposeful. God is not trying to accomplish something by putting us through <coughs> hardship. Well, obviously not, because as, as we've already seen in this teaching, he wouldn't send the suffering in the first place, so obviously he can't have a purpose. Now, I'm not going to try and give a whole critique of prosperity theology or anything like that. What I want to do here is just to kind of bounce off those claims and help us to revise what the Bible does, in fact, have to say about suffering and our experience of it and God's role in it. Does that sound like a plan? So just so you know where we're going this morning, this first session will be slightly longer than the second session. Coffee break will be a few minutes later than the advertised 11 o'clock, uh, but we will actually finish on time at the end a little bit later on, just so you've got your kind of, you know, expectations right. <laughs> okay, well, first up, suffering is, in fact, normal. It seems such a trite thing to say. Uh, I'm almost embarrassed to say it in such a distinguished company as this. But it may be that some of us, and certainly some of the people that we seek to serve, do actually need reminding of this. Suffering is normal. In my family alone, we have alcoholism, divorce, clinical depression, eating disorders, chronic illness, sexual abuse, infertility, and suicide just in a fairly immediate scope of my family. The list goes on. My nephew took a trip with his friends at home um, before saying goodbye and heading off to uni. Uh, on the drive home, they slammed into an HGV, and he was killed, along with everybody else in the car. 18 years old. His life ripped out from before him. That's just my family. I'm absolutely certain that you could very easily draw up your own catalogue of issues that people close to you have had to endure in years past. Not even going to begin on our church family, we'd be here all day. But given who we are in this room, it might be worth reminding ourselves that Christian ministry doesn't in any way protect us from these kind of realities. It's the other way around, isn't it? Um, ministry lives often seem to exacerbate it. There's exhaustion, for one thing. I, you can never get to the bottom of that to-do list. There's always someone else that needs looking after in some way. It never ends. The more we do, the greater expectations we set up for what we will do in the future. So we become a victim of our own desire to serve. We, we can never do enough. It's just exhausting. There's discouragement. You come home from church one Sunday, perhaps, wondering where everybody is, and you flick on Facebook that afternoon, and there are pictures of sandcastles. Turns out two of your key families decided to spend the morning at the beach together. Church is so low down on the list for them that all it takes is for the sun to come out, for them to rearrange their Sundays and decide not to meet uh, their brothers and sisters in Christ. And you think... What am I doing? There's opposition. People opposing your ideas for new initiatives. People opposing your teaching when you're just trying to be faithful. Sometimes people just opposing you. I'm sure you've got somebody that comes to mind when I say that. Um, I certainly do. 16 years ago, a church was looking to call me as a pastor. Before the vote, I, I met up with somebody who I knew wasn't over the moon about the prospect of me going to that church. And I said to him, look, Stephen, it does look like the church is going to call me and um, ask me to come in this vote next week. And I have to ask you, if they do call me, how will you respond? What, what will you think of that? Well, you know, he just said, I would be devastated. 
it's Welsh, you see. You can, you can, you can do those kind of uh, uh, much better than I can. Well, I did come, and I thought I'd better just, you know, um, work to try to work, get our relationship into some kind of order, and I went down to visit him, and in fact, I kept visiting every six months or so. I just made myself do it. I've got to do this. And we'd have a cordial chat of these six monthly visits, and at the end, it would always end the same way. He'd just say, oh, Orlando, the thing is, I just wish you would leave. <laughs> <laughs> He'd slip job advertisements into my pigeonhole at church. He had known about me to anybody who had listened. We had a church meeting once, and uh, a whole congregational meeting. We were coming up to a church mission week, and uh, I was leading a kind of brainstorming session. What events can we do to uh, reach our community? What, what should we do, everybody? And no idea, too stupid. Just put your hands up. What have you got? Stephen, as the first to speak, stands up and said, well, the first thing we could do with this is getting rid of you. Get a new pastor in front of the entire church. I mean, it was almost funny, except that it actually wasn't funny. Just being a human punch bag like that, time after time after time. And ministry's like that sometimes, isn't it? I'm sure you know it as well as I do. People you come across. No wonder so many of us come to a bad end. We burn out. The exhaustion of trying to live up to people's expectations of us finally catches up with us. We drop out. Get so discouraged, we leave church ministry and go and run a Christian retreat centre. Get a job in the de denominational hierarchy, something like that. We fall out. Get so desperate to escape the frustration that we end up in total moral failure. We've, I guess we've seen that in all sorts of people around. Or we sell out our desire for some kind of response, any response, leads us to alter the message that we've stood for until we find that response. It's happening all around us, isn't it? Ministry circles. The people of God are not spared hardship, and they never have been. We would know that. But let's see it for ourselves. Uh, turn up Psalm 88, uh, perhaps the most famous psalm of lament. Uh, I don't know how you think about lament. It seems to me if joy is the rhythm of the song of life, that is the thing that keeps the song going, the key in which it's often sung is lament. And here is someone uh, setting that key for us in Psalm 88. So just back in pairs and threes, have a look through the psalm, just quite briefly. Uh, see if you could just describe in your own words some of the things the psalmist is feeling at different points through the psalm. Quite, see if you can cover the whole psalm in just a couple of minutes. So just uh, uh, quite quickly, just in twos, threes, where you are uh, sitting right there. Well, it's rather a bleak Bible study, isn't it? Uh, seeing just how he feels. But it, you see in verse 1, he's, he's desperate, he's struggling, verse 3, to keep his head above water. He feels helpless, verse 4. He's, verse 6, he feels cut off from God, in the lowest pit. Verse 8, he's alone, he's just trapped, and on it goes until the end. Darkness is my closest friend. The despair is total. As I say, it's really bleak, isn't it? But if you've spent enough time in the Psalms, you know that these kind of themes are there all over the place in this book. And as with the old Israel, so with the new. Look at Paul. Here's a man sold out for the service of Jesus and the gospel. And what was his experience? had to endure horrendous personal pain, didn't he? That thorn in the flesh, pleaded with God repeatedly to take it away, but no, God left him stuck with it. Had to endure relational pain. Those disagreements, those slights, that reputational damage forced him onto the back foot so often, 
And of course, he had to endure physical hardship too. Remember that uh, reflection in 2 Corinthians 11. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods, pelted with stones, shipwrecked. You know the passage. And here is the New Testament believer. We know more about than anybody else. His life has just shot through with hardship. Suffering is normal. It's to be expected. I hope for most of us here that doesn't really need saying. But I do think we need to be reminded of it from time to time. If I'm feeling the sharper edges of life just at the moment, I'm not kind of some kind of anomaly. I'm not weird. This is just normal, even for God's people, perhaps especially for God's people. Well, look, let's uh, move on to the second thing. We need to remind ourselves about suffering. And that is uh, the, really the main thing I want to concentrate on. It's that suffering is not a God-free zone. Suffering is not a God-free zone. Now, I don't know the makeup of the various churches that are represented here in the room. Uh, we have people coming and going all the time at Christ Church. A lot of movement, inevitably lots of people that do arrive that are not well versed in good teaching. And the way that shows itself often is that their view of God is just a flat view of God. It's a two-dimensional view of God. It's a caricature more than a biblical portrait. And so I often need to challenge them. Let me share with you, if I may, a kind of five questions I might ask them to sort of lead them through a... Um, a program of expansion of their conception of God. Five questions that provide a framework for that kind of journey. Question one, how do you instinctively conceive of God? That is, how do you expect him to interact with you? Does he come loving you or hurting you? Does he come offering rescue or, or trouble? Does he come serving up healing or harm? Now, there's only one way you can really answer a question like that, the same way we'd all answer. Unless we're very unusual, we instinctively think of our Heavenly Father as coming with love and rescue and healing. And wonderfully, the Bible teaches that is exactly what God does, how he does come to us. But straight away, we're on to question two, which is, what shape do you think that love takes? I mean, just, just think about it for a moment. What does, what does real life love actually look like? Doesn't real life love sometimes take the form of tough love? If they're parents, I might ask, that, you know, don't you make decisions sometimes about your children which are for their long-term good, but which might produce tears in the short term, don't you? I hope you do. And what happens in real life rescues? You haul somebody out of a pit, might not they suffer some rope burn on the way out? What happens in real-life healings? Like when you go to the doctor, don't some of those doctors and nurses give you some pretty horrible experiences like yucky medicines and terrifying needles and sharp scalpels and all sorts of... Th you can see the point I'm trying to get across. It's just the very simple point that the, the journey to the destination we want to reach is often littered with sharp, painful stones underfoot. And that's just as true of the journey that God takes us towards the new creation. In these early days of the journey, these, these, just, these first few decades that we call our earthly life, God knowingly takes us on a painful route Now, those two questions actually might be enough for some. A lot of people will just get it at that, at that point. But not for all. And so sometimes there's a need for a question three, which is, how far do you want to go to separate God from pain? See, for some, any association between God and pain just makes God into a monster. <laughs> 
And that can't be. And so the instinct at this point is to get God off the hook for my pain. And there are various ways to do that. By rethinking the way that God runs the world. For example, there is uh, the conception of God as a part-time God. Or what I call the, the cruise control God. He's there in the driving seat, but most of the time he's just clicked on the cruise control, as I was doing on the M27 this morning, by just letting the world tick along and do its own thing at its own pace. But if there's pain or hardship uh, around, what the, that means, of course, that God, that wasn't on God's watch. I mean, he does intervene from time to time, but that clearly wasn't one of the times he was intervening. That wasn't him. It was someone else, not God. Or else there's the conception of God as the passive, reactive God. This is where you adopt language to describe God's relationship to suffering, which makes it sound completely different to his relationship to anything else. So God sent his blessings, he initiated this positive event, he gave us that opportunity, uh, or whatever it is. But if it's a hard experience, if it's something painful, the most we'll say is that, oh, God allowed it. He just wasn't, he wasn't actively involved, he just didn't intervene to stop it. Or else there's a third type of God, what you might call the perfunctory God. I've got my three Ps, I'm done for the morning, excellent, can retire now. This is where you go the whole way and remove him from the picture altogether. He flicked the first domino perhaps and got it all going, but since then, things have just continued on without any involvement of his at all. He may as well just kick his feet back and watch the shopping network or, uh, for all we know. So obviously, he cannot be responsible for pain. He's not got his hands anywhere near the wheel. You may recognise that as the god of deism. You can see what all these approaches are really doing. <coughs> Effectively, uh, they are shrinking God down, aren't they? A part-time God, a passive God, a perfunctory God. They're all just ways of downsizing him. And the motivation, as I say, is what? It's to, it's to let God off the hook for all the suffering. Individual suffering, world suffering, whatever. It seems like if you, if you have to pin the pain on God, then that turns him into someone you don't really want to know. So he needs to be let off the hook. But now comes the big question I've been waiting to ask them. It's this. Question four. Does the God of the Bible want to be let off the hook? That's the question. And this is the point at which I get the Bible out and show them some verses they never knew were there. I'll take them to Lamentations 3, verse 38, for example. Um, and uh, uh, you can look it up yourself. It's on the screen if you want. Is it not from the mouth of the Most High that good and bad come? The answer is obviously driving at us, yes. Or Isaiah 45, verse 7. I form light and create darkness. I make well-being and create calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things. Here is God explicitly taking responsibility as much for the disastrous things as for comfort and happiness. Ecclesiastes 7.14, in the day of prosperity, be joyful. And in the day of adversity, consider God has made the one as well as the other. In other words, if we're doing well in life, it's from God, but if we're having a complete shocker of a day, or a week, or a year, or a lifetime, that is just as much from God. Now at this point, I, you can see the eyebrows shooting up. They've only ever thanked God for good things, because he's obviously behind them, but when life gets hard, They've acted as though God were looking the other way. Um, now, I don't want to be careful here. I 
I do, th when you take the whole uh, range of the biblical data into consideration, I, I do think it is fair to say that God stands behind painful experiences in a slightly different way to the way he stands behind joyful things. It's, it's not entirely symmetrical if you look at the whole picture, I don't think. There's a reason why theologi theologians adopt the language of ordaining things uh, rather than sending things. But he still stands behind it. That's the thing. And so to my last question, what exceptions will you still fight for? See, at this point, I'm, at this point, I'm just hammering it home to make the point. What about something that's really awful, I might say? What, what about birth defects? Exodus 4, verse 11. Who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf? or seeing, or blind. Is it not I, the Lord? You have to remember, this is how God decided it would be. What about somebody's financial woes? Poverty. 1 Samuel 2, verse 7, the Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and he exalts. What about infertility? Something people in our church are struggling more than we've I've ever experienced uh, before. But remember Hannah, the Lord closed her womb. It's God's decision, God's decision that for the time being at least, she, she couldn't have a baby. What about the things that are done to us by other people? In other words, if somebody is nasty to me or, or hits me, Surely that is matter, a matter just between me and them. God's not in that, right? Wrong. Isaiah 19, verse 2. And I, the Lord, will stir up Egyptians against Egyptians, and they will fight each against each other. One example among many we could turn to to show that even when it's other people causing us grief, God is in the background there uh, causing it. What about storms and downpours, mass flooding, topical at the moment, in Lincolnshire at least. Job 37, verse 11, He, the Lord, loads the thick cloud with moisture, the clouds scatter his lightning, they turn around and around by his guidance to accomplish all that he commands them on the face of the habitable world. The point I'm trying to make is, as you read the Bible, you don't find God washing his hands of the troubles of the world. He doesn't say, not my fault, not my area. Quite the reverse. He, he takes responsibility. He positively invites us to pin the pain on him. Now, I know that obviously begs lots of big questions like, why? <laughs> I'll get on to that in a second. But uh, can I just step back for a moment? I I've been taking you through the kind of conversation I might have with someone as I try to rebuild that 3D view of God for them and in their minds. But I wonder if it might just be worth us reflecting here, now, uh, ourselves. Don't you think this kind of God or the fact that we have this kind of God is actually a relief. And I was trying um, earlier on to, to bring to the surface some of those real life hardships that we do experience. But when you stop to think about it, don't you think it's good news that God stands behind our pain? Because, well, the alternative is awful, isn't it? Think about it. The alternative is that suffering really is as random and meaningless as Richard Dawkins says it is. But if it's God who stands behind that pain, however many questions that produces in our heads, we know he must have a purpose for it, and a good one. 
It's not out of his control. It's not something that takes him by surprise and derails his, his plans. And so the Christian actually takes comfort in knowing that even the most terrible suffering is still under the control of our sovereign God. Uh, that said, uh, it would be good to understand why, wouldn't it? What, what could possibly bring a good and holy and loving God to inflict pain on those he's made in his own image and brought into his own family? Uh, that is the question that brings on my, to my third point, which is this. Not only is suffering normal and from God, it is also purposeful. Which is simply to say God knows what he's doing. And he knows why he's doing it. When he does usher us along that road littered with those sharp, painful stones underfoot. And wonderfully, to some extent, he shows us his hand. Not in detail, not in the form of some custom-made, fully personalised commentary on what he's doing in your life and mine. But he does give us something. Uh, to start with, he gives us uh, that baseline assurance that he is working for the good of those who love him. For their good. How many times have you quoted that verse to somebody trying to encourage them, trying to give, make, help them to make sense of what they're going through or have been through? But I wonder how many times you actually, like me, need to quote it to yourself. I need to hear it, at least as often, I think, as I say it to others. It is a priceless encouragement, isn't it? Why don't we just take a moment, uh, again, in our small groups, um, just to encourage each other at this point. We, we rarely, I think, get to understand what God is doing through our pain in the moment itself. But sometimes, sometimes, as we look back, perhaps years later, it does begin to dawn on us. Have you had that experience? The veil seems to be lifted on what God's purposes were in that period of your life. As I say, not always, but sometimes. Just in those uh, twos, threes, fours, or whatever it is, just share with those around, if you're happy to. Um, perhaps if there's been anything in your life which you've come to realise later in the day was what God was actually achieving through that period. Are you happy to do that? Again, just a couple of minutes um, to, to share with each other. Okay, let me um, draw us back there. I'm aware asking you to share like that is quite a big thing to ask you to do in this kind of context, especially if you're sitting next to people you don't really know. So. I hope I haven't brought back too much pain to the surface in an unhelpful way. I hope it's been more of an encouragement to others um, than a, a pain to ourselves. I want to finish this session by just looking at a, a couple of the purposes that God is on record for having in mind when he does subject his people to that kind of tough love that we were talking about earlier on. So first... He uses pain to make us more like Jesus. He uses pain to make us more like Jesus. Our Father has a very clearly stated objective for his children, and that is to conform us to the image of the Son he loves. Isn't that right? And he will do, or he'll use everything at his disposal to contribute towards that aim being achieved. His, his word, the, the example of other Christian believers, their encouragements, their challenges, their rebukes, material blessings somehow, but he'll, he'll also use pain. Christian people have always found that the seasons of life in which they grew most in their discipleship 
were not the easy times, but the hard times. Well, I've certainly found that. I don't know if it's just me. <laughs> the experience of pain is just one more and perhaps the most effective tool that God uses to make us more like Jesus. For example, God uses pain to grow our humility. Most of us, I take it, uh, had that tendency um, to big ourselves up, don't we? Uh, sometimes the only thing that will bring us down to size is real personal suffering. Uh, we were thinking earlier, weren't we, about that thorn in the flesh that the Apostle Paul had to endure. We don't know the details. Maybe if you preached on that passage or led a Bible study on it with somebody else, or you formed an opinion of what was really going on there. It seems like it was some kind of chronic illness or disability or something. But what's striking is that he knows why he has it. A thorn was given me, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. To keep me from becoming conceited. Very striking. But that, that danger of conceit growing in Paul, of him getting too big for his boots, was something God chose to act on. That may well be the reality for some of us. We may need the, the experience of suffering to avoid becoming full of ourselves, or should I say, even fuller of ourselves. It's to, to, re, to remember to keep looking to him for strength, to keep seeing God for the mind-blowingly powerful and supreme God that he is. Then again, God also uses pain to grow our holiness. Uh, you know the old preacher's story, I'm sure, about Michelangelo's famous sculpture of David. Do you know the story? No? Oh, I assume we're all familiar. Oh, in that case, I'll give this to you. And uh, this will be my gift to you and your ministry this week. You can go home with at least something for this morning and have a nice uh, thing to, 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 to bring to your congregations next Sunday. The raw material that uh, Michelangelo uh, started with uh, when he uh, went to work on, on David was not promising. The block of marble he worked on had already been rejected by Donatello. Uh, just too many imperfections. But Michelangelo saw what he could make of it. So he went to work. For two years, he hammered and he chiseled, chipped away. And on the 5th of January, 1504, the veil was dropped on the sculpture that would take the breath away from millions of people. But it could not have been done without the sharp, cutting edge of that chisel. It preaches well, um, but I think that's because it connects well. Uh, most of us are aware of failings in our lives, but I'm pretty sure none of us uh, take them as seriously as we should, and so we need our Heavenly Father to help us. Uh, the believers to whom the letter of Hebrews was written had been through a horrendous time of persecution. It would be very easy to point the finger of blame to their persecutors, wouldn't it? But remember, that the, the writer actually points the finger in a different direction, doesn't he? Hebrews 12, endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. What children are not disciplined by their father. If you're not disciplined, and everybody goes, undergoes discipline, then you're not legitimate. You're not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we've all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. When life is painful, consider that it may be God sculpting us to become those spiritual works of art he plans to make of us. 
suffering as God's way of refining us, making us more like him. And again, suffering is, uh, well, potentially, God's way of growing us in hope. Uh, 20 years ago, I was uh, working as an itinerant evangelist in Sydney, in Australia, alongside uh, the veteran evangelist John Chapman. It was a great, very exciting year for me. Uh, the way it worked, basically, was somebody would call up into the Department of Evangelism and say, hi there, we're having a church mission. Of my Australian accent, we've gone from Welsh to Australia now, haven't we? <laughs> Fantastic. We're, we're having a church mission. Can we, can we have Chapo come to speak, please? And the answer would come back, ah, sorry, mate, he's booked up. But we've got this funny kind of pommy guy, a bit of a funny accent, stupid name, but he might be all right for you. What do you reckon? There'd be a pause. The guy would say, are you sure Chapo's not available then? <laughs> anyway, I got to go to around to all these different, um, uh, different churches which Chapo could do everything. It was a great job. But when I began that job, somebody said to me, it may have been Chapo himself, said, the problem you find here in Sydney is that everybody thinks they're already in heaven. Everybody thinks they're already in heaven. And actually, there was a bit of truth in that. There was a kind of, oh, we've got, we've got it good, and there's an awareness of that. I'm not sure that would be the same now, actually. But anyway, that's how it felt then. African slaves in the cotton fields of the American South did not need to be reminded that they weren't in heaven. They coped with their circumstances, as you know, by reminding each other of future deliverance in the songs that they sang. Swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home, and, and so on. And it's a leaf out of that book, not the Australian book, that the Bible seems to want to take us on. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6, So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 16 to 18. Now do you see how Paul's present suffering actually served to increase his excitement about what was to come. It may take real pain in our lives or, or seeing it in the lives of people we love to get us starting to focus on future glory. Heaven can't just be a tag-on belief for us. It needs to fill our horizons and shape our lives. Well, that's one uh, thing suffering does for us, makes us more like Jesus. It's an opportunity for us to grow in our humility and our hope and our holiness. Second purpose that God may have in mind is simply drawing people to Jesus. Uh, this is the old C.S. Lewis quote that we've all uh, used time and time again, I'm sure. God whispers, you know, it from in our pledges. He, he speaks to us in our conscience. He shouts to us in our pain. Pain is God's megaphone to rouse a deaf world. I think that's actually quite a biblical thought. Uh, certainly the experience of lots of people. Um, think about your own ministry. What points do you find that people are most soft to the gospel? It's generally three points, isn't it? When they're young, when things change, or when things go wrong. Is that not fair? It takes the rug being pulled out from under their feet to make them realise their need for a saviour. And that may well be the testimony of some of us here, maybe how you came to Christ. But actually, if you follow the contours of the Bible, you quickly realise there's much more to say than that. For one thing, God uses suffering to embolden the tellers of the gospel. That is to motivate people like you and me to share the good news. 
that's what happened um, with Paul when he was in prison. Remember Philippians 1, verse 14? Most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. In other words, Paul suffering in prison was a spur to the evangelism of his fellow believers. I guess the people saw him in chains and thought, golly, I'm not really putting my weight, am I? Maybe I should start taking this evangelism thing more seriously. Or something like that. I don't know about you, but I certainly find contemplating those great ones of the past who were martyred for refusing to deny the gospel as a great spur. Then again, suffering creates opportunities for gospel ministry. I suppose the classic example of that is the stoning of Stephen, or what happened after the stoning of Stephen, when the authorities decided they were going to stamp out the Christian movement once and for all. Um, you have a look at Acts chapter 8, verse 1. Um, you got it there? Acts, chapter, Acts 8, verse 1. Call it up. I don't think I've got a slide for this one, maybe... Acts 8, verse 1, And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the, except the apostles. And you might think, well, that was it. That is the end of the Christian movement. Nice while it lasted, but the foot has been put down and it's over. Um, but actually, that is not what happened. Uh, nothing even close. Uh, that's because in God's purposes, actually relocating those Christian believers just meant multiplying the places where the gospel could be proclaimed. So verse 4, now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. I wonder how many times something like that has been repeated in Christian history. On all sorts of scales, Joe gets sick, goes to hospital, starts chatting to the person in the next bed, that person is converted and becomes a missionary. Any number of times something like that must have happened, and maybe that will be what happens through your suffering when it comes to you, or when it came to you. Then again, God uses suffering to enable people to hear and respond to the gospel. I don't know if you've uh, reflected on this, but there's a very interesting comment that Paul makes in Colossians chapter 1. Uh, you're familiar with it, I'm sure. Now I rejoice in my sufferings, he says. Uh, in my flesh I'm filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church. Now, what can he mean there? Is he saying Christ didn't suffer quite enough to accomplish our salvation and I've got to finish off the job? You hope that nobody here would argue for that interpretation. Christ's suffering was complete and perfect. He did everything that was needed to achieve our salvation. What Paul is doing here is, well, he, he throws himself into that hard and sometimes dangerous work of bringing news of that salvation to people so they can respond to it. So even after the cross, there was a further suffering that needed to happen. The suffering that goes with faithful and energetic gospel witness. So, once again, God is using suffering to advance his gospel. And actually, recognising that might be what God is intending when we go through hard times. Uh, to realise that he is doing that, it can be a wonderful comfort. We're not enduring all this for nothing. One day we'll turn up at the pearly gates, as it were. There may be somebody, there may be many people who come up to us and say, oh, thank you. Had we not faced the pain that we faced, they would not, humanly speaking, be in the kingdom. So you see, God knows what he's doing with our suffering. Our suffering is purposeful. 
We may not know specifically what he's doing when life gets hard for us, for the people that we love, but there is a divine purpose to it. There's a mind behind it. Uh, we started off, you recall, looking at those claims of the prosperity teachers. Uh, as we flipped around the Bible in this session, I hope you can appreciate afresh, perhaps, how foolish, utterly foolish, those claims are in the light of God's revelation to us. Is suffering strange? No. Is suffering something that stands apart from God? No. Is suffering meaningless? No, not if you believe the Bible. Um, if you are hurting at the moment, and I imagine in a gathering like this, there'll be a number who are experiencing significant pain in one form or another, then look in the mirror and say to yourself, one, it won't last forever. There's something wonderful coming. And two, the sovereign God knows what he's doing. He's leading us along that road to rescue and love and healing. Even if those stones underfoot are sharp. Shall I pray and then we'll close? I, I, we'll have some questions at the beginning of the next session, but it's time for coffee now. Uh, and so let me pray and to close now. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for revealing to us something of what you're doing and why. So grateful that you haven't left us in the dark about your intentions and your purposes. And thank you for giving us these perspectives and the framework of eternity with which to work through these questions of ours. And pray that for those in this room who are going through hard times, and for those in our churches who are suffering greatly, you would use your word to bring comfort and understanding and hope. Amen.